We're going to be continuing today our series in the book of First Peter. Uh, last week, we actually uh, started First Peter and started looking at uh, all the truths that are found even in that very first passage there, first couple of passages. And today, we're going to actually be picking up where we left off. We're going to go from verses 13 all the way to 25. So we have a good uh, space to jump through uh, with these passages, but it's going to be really good this morning. We're going to be really focusing in this morning on a call to holy living, right? A call to holy living, how God calls us to live in a manner in which we believe. And this is a very important and practical message for each one of us. If you would, stand me one last time as we go to the word of the Lord together. It's something we like to do here as we read God's word together and going through his word and standing in reverence to his word. If you don't have a copy of the word of God, you can look on the screen uh, as well. It'll be up there for you. And the word of the Lord says this to us. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. If you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for you. Through him, you believed in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have been, since you purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other, from a pure heart, uh, love one another constantly, because you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this word is the gospel that was proclaimed to you. Amen. You may be seated. This is the word of God for the people of God. You know, years ago, the word cold or cool had a very distinct meaning. Someone said that they were cold. It simply meant that they were cold because of the breeze that they were facing of the day. Well, today we know that the word cold or cool can have a myriad of meanings. In fact, depending on your cultural context, cold could actually mean something very good, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're freezing. It could mean something is immensely great. It could mean that you're actually cold. It could mean a whole slew of things. Words and definitions change over time, and that is a reality. Yet we should ask the question, if words and definitions change, does the word Christian progress with time as well? I think that's a fair question to ask. To ask, does the function and purpose of a Christian change over time? Well, if you hold to the word either not being the source of life, not being the source of our faith and practice, then your answer would be to the affirmative. Yes, the you know, word Christian does change and should change. Behold that God is not the ultimate source and that we exist to glorify him and enjoy him forever, then your answer would be an affirmative yes. Yeah, the word Christian should change. However, if you are indeed a born-again, spirit-filled, blood-washed believer who stands on the authority and the the inerrant word of God, then your answer will always be no. The word Christian or what it means to be a follower of Christ does not change. As Troy Goss, Pastor Troy Goss said to us a couple of weeks ago when he came, he said, you know, God is not only good all the time, 
But God is right all the time. So we see Peter continuing with his encouragement and exhortation of the believers living dispersed because of persecution. And last week we saw how we're called to hope, that we have a living hope. And today in the verses before us, we see we're called to live holy. We're called to a life that reflects the God we serve and the redemption we have. We're called to live in light of the salvation of our souls. So the same way Christians lived 2,000 years ago, we're called to live the same way today. Let's jump into the text. Let's look at verse 13 first. As we see here, the first point is to live with a mind ready and alert. Therefore, set with your minds ready for action. Be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I listened to a Christian on YouTube this week, and they were talking about um, the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that this Christian said out of his mouth, he said, the, the only proper way to really receive the Holy Spirit is to shut off your mind to receive the Holy Spirit. Anytime you hear teaching, whether it is more taught or as they say caught, that tells you to shut off your thinking, either A, they're unlearned, or B, it's a cult. Sadly, many times people are unlearned to think God does not want to engage your thinking. But the reality is, for a Christian, you're never called in the Scripture to turn off your faculty of thinking. Peter tells the exiles how they should live amidst a world bent on coming against them with lies. And he says the way you do that is to keep your minds ready for action. Essentially, Peter was saying, in these last days, we must stay alert. And one reason we stay alert, as the Bible teaches, is that we have an enemy, an enemy who the Bible describes as a roaring lion. And he's prowling around seeking whom he may devour. Well, with what? With false teaching is one thing. Lies from the world system and all these different things. This is why we're doing this series on Wednesday. And if you missed this past Wednesday, come this Wednesday. As well, why we're dealing with these things is because God wants us to know what we believe and then actually live it out. Is it any wonder the Bible teaches us not to be drunk with wine, but to be full of the Spirit? We're called to be sober-minded. In fact, this passage, Peter pulls from the Old Testament and points us to this idiom or this phrase where it says there, therefore with your minds ready for action. This is an idiom Peter uses that you read often, and the King James says it like this, you're called to gird up your loins. Now, what this means is Peter's pulling from this Old Testament kind of view of this, girding up the loins of your mind. This is what it's saying. In short, it's saying, prepare oneself for learning and thinking. Get your mind ready for action to learn and to be alert. Now, if you look back in the book of Exodus, we see the Lord instructing his children to gird up their loins, to be ready for action. Where do we see this? Well, Exodus 12, 11. the Bible says this, here's how you must eat it. It's talking about the first Passover. And remember, God is instructing them that he's delivering them from slavery, and now they're going to go into the freedom that he has for them. And he says, when you eat this first Passover, this is how you must eat it. You must be dressed for travel, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You're to eat it in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. In fact, what this looked like, they usually would have this longer robe, and what they would do is that they would have kind of a belt that they would tuck this in so they would be able to be agile and nimble to move and be ready for action. And this is how we're called to be without thinking. So it is with being sober-minded. We're not called to be irrational thinkers, but we're called to be composed in our thinking. I saw a lady on YouTube the other day, and I do, I watch a lot of YouTube videos. I just get a lot of stuff from there. And she was engaging with a cult, and and here's the thing, I'm not saying this lady was not a Christian. 
I'm just trying to give you what, what this kind of looks like sometimes when people turn off the faculty of their thinking and they're not reasoning and cannot give a defense for what they believe. And she was talking to this person who was in the cult, and he was spouting all sorts of lies uh, from the Bible. He was eisegeting the Scripture. He was reading into the text. And so what she did, she just, you know, I guess, I guess she caught the Holy Ghost. I don't know what she was doing. She looked foolish. And here he was lying, and she couldn't stand on two feet. As they say in our common vernacular, she couldn't stand Ten toes down on the authority of the scripture and thus declare, thus says the Lord. All she could do was this. Hey, show ho, hey. Ma'am, the devil is not bothered by that. Your show ho and ha ha and all that, that does nothing. It only makes you feel good. It doesn't edify the saints. It doesn't allow you to articulate the the beauty of the gospel. All it does is make you a laughing stock. Man, you say, that's heavy. I want it to be heavy. Because I want you to be able to not only know what you believe, but live out what you believe and love robustly in the faith. Well, you say, what does the Bible say? Well, 1 Peter 4, 7. He goes on to say this right here. The end of all things is near. Therefore, he says, why should you be alert and so reminded? It's because the end of all things are near. So he says, how do we say sober-minded? Well, it says in the text, therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace we brought to you at the revelation. So he says, look, you should completely, without end, essentially saying this should be non-ending. It's not a time where you stop. Unless you die and go on to be with Jesus while you're here, you're called to set your minds on Jesus Christ. We're called to set our minds on the living hope. And we're called to understand that fixing our eyes on Jesus is meant to empower our living in the right now. So our eyes fixed on Jesus causes us to be helpful and useful right now. When you come to church and you hear the word of God, it should, in fact, inform you and equip you to then go out and live as God has called you to live. If you're coming and you're leaving the same way, there's being no change, and you have to ask yourself, Lord, is my heart being humbled? Is my mind being open? Your marriage should be different because you're a Christian. Your job, how you work on your job, it should be different because you're a follower of Jesus. Your parenting should be different because you're a follower of Jesus. If you're not yet married or if you're in a season where God has you as as not yet married, you living in that manner should be lived out because you belong to Jesus. So, how do we do this? We set our minds on him. We fix our eyes on Jesus. And why do we keep our eyes on Jesus? Well, he is the hope we have in this life. He is alive. He's coming again with reward in his hand for his people. Think of the day. The Bible says, look, you hold on to this hope because it's brought, it's going to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, we have hope. But then we have the reward that is coming when he returns. You think about that day when we're going to see Jesus and be in his presence forevermore. That is going to be a day of rejoicing. But we're not just going through life. We're awaiting for him to come. We're going through life with hope and joy and walking it out according to his will, knowing that there are rewards that come from his hand. So living with sober minds and minds that are ready and alert actually takes vigor. What does that mean? That means it doesn't just happen by osmosis. Now, what does that mean? My grandfather was a principal and a school teacher. My grandmother was a school teacher, and they raised me, and it was horrible. It, It was horrible for other reasons. It was great 
being like the grandchild, it wasn't good when school was happening. I was a horrible math student. And my grandfather was a principal, and he would always say, it is not going to come by osmosis. You have to actually labor in math to get it. I say, the devil is a liar. No, I don't. (laughs) Just like your faith, though, right? We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Yet we, we daily walk out our salvation with both fear and trembling. We're going to see he's saying the same thing here. We are then, we're engaging with the Lord. We're engaging with his word. We're, we're, we're striving not to earn salvation. We're not striving in that sense, but we're saying, Lord, daily I'm going to walk with you. Daily I'm going to grow with you. I'm going to grow in my understanding of the word. I'm going to pray and read the word of God and share my faith. Having your mind alert takes vigor. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live this way for His glory daily. You know, think about it this way. It is easy to think like everyone else. It is easy. It's it's super easy to think like everyone else, right? If everyone else has one way of thinking, it is easy to jump with a crowd. But for us, we're called to have our minds set and our, and our eyes fixed so that our thinking reflects what the Word of God teaches. So, we're called to live and to think and act like Jesus. I mean, that is such a simple statement, but it is very profound. We're called to act, think, and live like Jesus. I mean, like, you could just close it up right there. That's the message, right? We're called to act, live, and think like Christ. And so he goes on to go deeper into this point. And we see in verse 14, we're called to live as a child of God, holy. We're called to live as a child of God, holy. Again, as a reminder, verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. All people are created in the image and likeness of God. This is the doctrine that we hold to, known as the Imago Dei. Every person has dignity, value, and worth. This is why we we value all people, no matter what their backgrounds are, no matter what their ethnicity, no matter what sin they're caught up in, they have dignity, value, and worth because they're created by God. Now, here's the other side of the coin. Not every person is a child of God. Okay, you say, well, where's that in the Bible? This is what we're going through right here. It says, verse 14, as obedient children. Peter illustrates this point here. He says, look, you exiles, those who are dispersed, those who are all over because of persecution, live as obedient children. See, the true child of God will see in a moment that they're not born of flesh, but born from above and actually desire to live in obedience to their Father in heaven. There are two things we see in the entirety of Scripture as it relates to fathers and children. First, we see fathers care for their children, and the children were commanded to obey their fathers. Language matters. Definitions matter. It, remember, if you're just running around saying these are all God's children, then what you're saying is you're taking away what Jesus said in John 3, 3, that you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. What we should be articulating and what the church, and when I say the church, this is not me picking on the church, because I love the bride of Christ. What we've seen over, um, over the time period, especially in America, is not the whole of the church, it is Christians who have not had a robust orthodoxy with a robust orthopraxy, meaning they didn't really, they, some Christians know what they believe, but they don't live it out. Orthodoxy means you know rightly what you believe, or the praxis says, I'm going to walk it out. The two come together, make Christianity. What we've seen, especially in America, you've had many Christians who had a lot of orthodoxy, Oh, yeah, we believe the Scripture teaches all people are made in the image and likeness of God, but then their orthopraxy was horrible, and they mistreated people based on their faith. 
We don't isolate and take just those people and say, see, this now erases everything the Scripture teaches. No, what that does, it just shows how inconsistent they were. What it should cause us to do is say, Lord, help us to walk in consistent orthodoxy and orthopraxy. So, every person is made in the image and likeness of God. That is orthodoxy. Another part of orthodoxy is that the only way to enter the kingdom of God is you must be born again. Because the children of God actually obey the Father. God is a good God. He's a good father, and those who are his children are commanded to obey this benevolent, gracious, forgiving, forgiving, mighty father. His ways are always right. His ways are always just, and they lead us to the way of life always. Yet the opposite is true. Disobedience will lead away from his way, and it leads to our own way, which leads to destruction. So think of this, many believe God is oppressive. This is how you know somebody is not following God. When things come out of their mouth such as God is oppressive, the word of God isn't true. I believe some of the Bible, but not all the Bible. It's not all, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's hold, hold, the, hold the horses because people who say God is oppressive because he commands marriage as a means and way sex is to be enjoyed in practice, you can see that they're not true children of God. How can you call one who is so benevolent and good oppressive in any way in any of his ways? No, he is good, and he gives us the way of life that leads to life. No. In fact, I would challenge this person. I would challenge any person who says God's oppressive for his thoughts and his ethics about sexual morality to list me. And I'll give you $1,000. List me every positive thing that comes from sexual immorality. I just wait. I know I'll have $1,000 in my pocket. Name me one thing. Name me one, one inkling of thing that is positive from sexual immorality. We don't even have to have a pole in the room. Those of us who have engaged in that type of sinful lifestyle in the past know the brokenness it leads to. You know the danger it causes. But the way of the Lord is right. One may ask, when we live contrary to the way of God, what does it lead to? Well, it leads to destruction. But the Scripture tells us here, Why do people live this way? Well, look what it says. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. The Bible tells us here that at one time, we were all ignorant of the way of God. It seems what it's saying is we were unaware of the way of the Lord. Before Jesus, we were all being conformed in our behavior to the pattern of our sinful desires. Desire is not a bad thing. God just wants us to have godly desires and be conformed to those godly desires. This word desire here relates to any activity that is morally wrong. So before Jesus, you are conformed. Just like think of Plato. You're being conformed to the desires, the sinful desires of this world system. When you're born again, God says, come to me, and now I am the one you should conform to, not the world. The Christian lifestyle is called, in short, to reflect a holy God. So anything outside of that is disobedience. Okay, I'm going to just drop this on you, and and you can just get mad with the text because you see it for yourself in the text. This is not me. This is the text saying it. I want to give you this principle right here. The very idea of blank, whatever you want to put in there, Christian, doesn't exist. Put whatever adjective you want in there. If that adjective is a lifestyle or a way that walks in darkness, it is not Christ. I've just answered a lot of questions that you may have. 
Can you be this and be a Christian? Can you be that and be a Christian? No. Because if you're conforming your identity to something that is not Christ, you are not in Christ. I don't like that. Well, I'm just telling you the Bible says for us to be conformed to Christ. And each one of us may have a sinful proclivity that we struggle with, but yet the Scripture calls us to die to whatever that may be. Doesn't matter what it is. See, nobody gets a pass. It is Christ and Him crucified. We come to Him and we die to our old life. So Peter makes the point. You know you were ignorant before. You know how you were being conformed to this world system and their way of thinking and living. Yet now, because you are children of God, live as one with your eyes set on Jesus. 1 Peter 15 and 16, but as the one who's called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Let me put a pin here because, you know, I want to address this as an apologetic. He is not teaching a works-based salvation here. He is not saying your holiness, as Muslims teach, that the good you do will then outweigh the bad. And when you stand before God, then the good you do is going to outweigh it and then he'll let you into heaven. Or what, you know, the the, uh, cultural African consciousness community teaches, the whole idea with even in uh, Egyptian mythology that, oh, see, my heart is going to weigh out lighter than the feather. Jeremiah 17, 9 rips us all apart. The human heart is deceitful above all else. Who can know it? See, there's no way for you to repair your heart on your own. There's no good works you can do. You cannot muster up anything before a holy God to say, look at how good I am. Because compared to him, you are like nothing. This is not saying you are a worm. This is not saying you don't have value. But the scripture says very clearly our good works offered up to him are like filthy rags. Could you imagine we took one wash rag and everybody used it in this room? And then you gave it to the person who is is already cleaned and said, wipe your face with it? That's what it looks like when you offer up good works to God. Peter goes directly back to Leviticus 11, 44 here. And he is not stating believers are under any ceremonial law as those, as we see the laws being fulfilled in Christ and done away with in his finished work. It's fulfilled in him. But this reality remains. A holy God causes people to live holy as he is. Holy simply means to be set apart. That's who God is. And we call, he's calling us to be set apart as a people. And this is why Peter starts with the idea of us being exiles in this world. Holiness is an essential part of the very nature of God. So we are sanctified. So think about this. We are justified, meaning our sin is forgiven. And then we are sanctified. We are set apart. But we are not only just set apart just once. The Holy Spirit is continually sanctifying us. And our lives should reflect the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. So, we are called to be set apart for God's exclusive use and pleasure. Hear what I'm saying? You imagine you serve a God who wants you to be used for His glory and you exist for His pleasure alone. If you're wondering, and if you're a Christian, and you're wondering, man, I'm not yet married, and and Lord, I I struggle with the temptation of of even being sexually uh, immoral, and I don't want to be immoral, and it's a struggle. Yes, it is nothing wrong with dealing with temptation because you're human. We all deal with temptation. What happens? What do we do then? We come back to the Lord and say, God, I exist for your glory alone, so let my members and my mind reflect in whatever I'm doing for your glory. So I love you more, Lord. 
It's not whipping yourself over the back. That's not going to do it. It's not taking something else and punching yourself in the face and say, oh, if I make myself feel so bad about my sin, that's going to do it. It's coming back to the glorious truth that he is holy. And he is, he is radiantly good in every way. And he calls you to walk in the light of his holiness. And he says, you exist for my pleasure. That is good news. 1 John 1, 5 and 6 iterates this truth. This is the message you, we've heard from him and declared to you. God is light. And there's absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him, remember, we're talking about those who say they're children of God, and yet we walk in darkness. What does it say there? We are what? We are lying. And we are not practicing the truth, orthodoxy, orthopraxy, Christianity. You can't have one without the other. You need them both. And if you're a Christian this morning, maybe you know a lot of things, but yet you've not practically applied it. This is the call to live as he calls you to live now. I love this from Warren Wiersbe. This is so good. I love this. If something cannot be done to the glory of God, then we can be sure it must be out of the will of God. Woo, I love it. I'm going to have to read that one more again as they say. If something cannot be done to the glory of God, then we can be sure it must be out the will of God. You say, Lord, Pastor, I need to know the will of God. I need to know the secret things of God. This is it right here. You don't have to go to Prophet Sogo. You don't have to go to Apostle Sogo. You don't have to get miracle water. You can just say, if I can do this to the glory of God, I'm in his will. Oh, raising your children, it's in the will of God. Being committed to one, one spouse, it's in the will of God. Being faithful on your job, oh, that's in the will of God. Working hard to the glory of God, that's in the will of God. If you're single, not yet married, being like you are and living in that manner, that's to the glory of God. You say, well, what about other stuff? You can just go through the filter. Porn is not to the glory of God. Cussing your coworker out is not to the glory of God. Acting like everyone else in the world is not to the glory of God. I know some folks are going to get mad at this, but here's the thing, you know. And this is not to pick on ladies at all because, you know, this is the thing. Your man or conduct is not after a Beyonce type of thing. I'm just saying. If, that, if that's the model you're following to say, oh, if I, if I can do this, then I'll get a man. No, no, you won't. Me and your manner to follow is Jesus. Not everything else. Young people. I get it. I know you like the culture that's around you. And there's nothing wrong. I get it's fashion and all these things. But can I tell you something? These entertainers and all these rappers and all these people trying to sell you a lie, telling you it's good, they don't love you. God does. Live for his glory alone. See, this is, answers the question. Do I have to change my gender to glorify God. No, changing your gender does not glorify God. How God has made you glorifies him in every way. Because the one who created you down to the very fiber of your being says you exist for my glory alone. So how should we live then? How should we live then? We live as the redeemed. Look what it says, verse 17. If you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. 
Peter gives another side of this truth. We live holy because we serve a holy God and have been set apart. Yet the other side, we live holy because we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. This is what he's saying. He's saying, look, look at what Jesus has done and live in light of that. Live in light of the blood that was poured out for you. I love this. He goes on to say, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. Peter makes the point. When it comes to your salvation, who do you pray to? Who do you come to? You come to the Father. You come to the one who is over all things. And we come to the Father. Our Father is not only good, but the Bible says here, he is impartial. He does all things right and will indeed judge impartially. He does all things that are good. And on the final day, those who are in Christ will stand before, as the Bible teaches, the judgment seat of Christ. And our works, those done in the flesh, both good and bad, will be judged. Now, this judgment has nothing to do with your salvation. The Bible clearly articulates to us that this idea, this word judgment, even here, means to make a judgment based on the correctness or value of something. Essentially, each of us will give an account for our works, and each will receive the appropriate reward. This is, as one commentator said, a family judgment, the father dealing with his beloved children. And God will search into the motives of our ministry. He will examine our hearts, but he assures us that his purpose is to glorify himself in our lives, in the work we do for him. And then guess what? This is not a moment where anyone's going to be crying. Why? Because every man will praise God. So you live for him and you give glory to him and then you receive that reward and then he, your, your works are tried. And yet what, for what purpose? So that he may be glorified. You know, people make that joke of saying, oh, you know, God's going to say to some people you're done and some you're well, you're done. No, Jesus is going to say, well done, my servant. We receive from him the, the, the salvation of our souls. And there's nothing minuscule or small about that. We live to give him glory in everything we do. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says this, So don't judge anything prematurely before the Lord comes, who will both bring to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal, this is what, he, this is what their judgment is about, the intentions of the hearts. And then praise will come to each one from God. We don't know everyone's motives now. God does. And one day God will judge all of those motives. Well, why do we live this way? Because we've been redeemed. Redeemed from what? The slavery that was sin, death, and destruction. We've been purchased with a high price, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. In the Roman culture, a slave could actually save money to purchase their freedom. They could buy their redemption. Or another person could actually have the money, give it to their owner, and then they could purchase their redemption as well. This is the picture that Peter is writing about here. Yet look at what Peter says. Your redemption price was not something you could raise on your own, nor could anyone just do it for you. It was only found in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Remember our old life, it was in the flesh, living out our desires in the flesh. But yet the Bible says this in 1 Peter 4, 3 through 5, talking about the blood of Jesus. For there's already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose, choose to do. Carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. If you think we have it bad, it was always like this. It's just we see it now. So here's the thing. This is why I'm making this point. Oftentimes we try to almost make it as if you know, look at where we are now. Look at where they are. The Bible has no relevance to what's happening right now. Does it not? 
I mean, can I ask you, do you see unrestrained behavior around you now? Do you see evil desires around you now? Drunkenness, or just, do those things happen? Yes, they do. Especially in this generation now, it is even more so. Carousing and lawless idolatry. Look at verse 4, because this should be the, the real linchpin for all of us. They are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living. And what do they do because of it? They slander you. I'm just saying, I feel there's a generation of Christians who don't want that last piece. I don't want nobody saying bad, nothing about bad about me. And so for some of us, we need to be sanctifying our flesh because here's the thing, if somebody does slander you, you want to go off and slap them. No. Being slandered for Jesus is a good thing because you're living for his glory. Are people surprised that your lifestyle is different? Are they surprised that you have orthodoxy and orthopraxy? And again, we're not talking about being, you know, when you think of holiness like a bun and a long skirt. No, we're talking about actually living out what you believe. We're not just talking about, oh, I don't drink, I don't chew, I don't hang out with people who do. No, 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 we're not talking about that. We're actually talking about you living as exiles in the world and living in a manner that is distinctly different than those around you. We're not isolating ourselves. We're not Amish. We're engaged with the world. We live different, though, than the world. See, the Israelites would have to take a spotless lamb to the temple for sacrifice for their sin, yet Jesus' blood was the sufficient sacrifice that was, needed, that was needed once and for all. His blood was the, better than the blood of bulls and goats. His blood was the atoning work for our sins to be forgiven. And look what the Scripture says. It says, look, he was known from the foundation of the world. It shows us that Jesus was not some afterthought. He existed in the beginning, was revealed in the last times for one purpose, our redemption. Why did Jesus come? For our redemption. So that through him, we would have our full faith and hope in the God who raised him from the dead. Look at this scripture, Romans 4, 23 through 25, before we go to our last point. Now it's credited to him, was not written for Abraham alone, but also for us. It will be credited to us who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. See that word again, justification. Again, justified. We are justified just as if we had never sinned, but then we're sanctified, and then one day we're going to be glorified, completely made whole in Christ. And what does he sum all this up to? Our final point, live and love your brothers and sisters. Live and love your brothers and sisters. Look what the Bible says, since you purify yourselves by your obedience to the truth so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart of love, love one another constantly because you've been born again. Peter sums this point up right here. Those who have been purified, cleansed, those who are children of God and called to live holy, those who are walking in the truth, live it out by showing love for one another. Someone asked me the other day, and I think it's a great question. Why do people have such a hard time when they come to church? And what I mean by that is when you go on your job, it's... A love there you don't expect. You go on your job and Bill treats you wrong, you just go to HR. Or you politely cuss Bill out in a very respectable email, per our last conversation. (laughs) And you move on. You go to work the next day, you see Bill, we good. Church is just different. I wouldn't even have to show hands who, how many people have been church hurt or hurt in the church. If you've been a part of a Christian church for I old of a second, you're going to be hurt. 
But man, it's just something about church hurt that is not like hurt on the job. When someone hurts you in the body, it cuts somehow to the deepest core. I can guarantee you right now, there's people sitting here right now who still are wounded. Because someone you feel didn't love you right. Now, this is not discounting those who are false teachers, those who are abusive. Right, we we get that. I'm talking about the common everyday interactions with Christians. We just rub each other at times the wrong way. You say, Pastor, why is that? Because while we're still all justified, we're still being sanctified. And the same Holy Spirit that's working on you is working on Cleophas as well. It's just that sometimes Cleophas is a little slower in the maturity process than maybe you are. The word love here is the word Philadelphia, which is this idea of brotherly love. This love that is shown unceasingly to each other. And this should be the normal behavior for believers. In fact, this is how the world knows we're Christians, by our love for one another. And as one pastor said, that love in the church is a priority both because this is the intended nature of the church and because without it, the church would not be able to face the world. This is why the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. Because you strive or you labor for peace. It is hard. Think about it. Going to somebody and labor for that is very hard. This is why 1 Peter 2, 17, we're going to see this in a couple weeks. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. This is a command. This is an imperative. They were called to love the brothers and sisters. And why do we love? Because we have been changed. And we are constantly encountering the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the truth of God. This is what he's saying. Like the grass will fade, the flower will fade, we will fade, but his word endures forever. The gospel endures forever. And we stand firm on that. The truth of the gospel will never lose its power. And so we should be encountering the truth of the gospel daily in our lives. So much so that it is impacting even our relationships. He's not even talking about those outside the church. I think sometimes we have an overcorrection. In the church, we oftentimes, we, all we're thinking about is out the four walls, and we should. But in most of the epistles, it starts right here. Right here. There should be moments. You say, how do we know the Spirit is moving? How do we know the Spirit is moving? Is it when people are falling out? Is it when people are doing backflips? Is that when the Spirit is moving? No. The Spirit is moving when believers are living in a manner like Jesus. Repentance is happening. Restoration is happening. Generosity is happening. These things show the mark of a Christian. I want to say this to you. There's times when you are wronged, and there's times when you wrong. And for some of us in this room, you've been wronged and someone needs to make it right with you. But then there's others of us where you have wronged someone. And you need to make it right with them. Why? Because the scripture commands us to do it. How do we apply this? Here's the first thing. Are there beliefs and practices you're engaging in that are not glorifying to God? Are there beliefs and practices you're engaging in that are not glorifying to God? You know what they are. God knows what they are. Will you lay those down and say, Jesus, I don't want to engage in these anymore. I want new life in you. If you're a believer, maybe there's practices you're engaging in that are not glorifying to God. Can he get glory out of what you're doing? If not, lay it down. Here's the next one. Have you been wounded by a brother or sister that is causing you to withhold brotherly love. There's times where relationships need to end for the sake of unity, but then there's other times where they need to press forward. Times where it's an uncomfortable feeling, but 
Do you need to make it right with another brother or sister who's wounded you? And maybe they don't know they've wounded you. Maybe they just don't know. Maybe God is calling you today to go to them in love. Here's the last one. Can you say you are a child of God? Can you say you are a child of God? Can we bow our heads and close our eyes? In this moment, I ask some of our leaders to respond and come for those who need prayer. If you've heard anything in this message that has pricked your heart that you need to respond to, maybe there's a prayer need in your life. Maybe there's something you need to truly come to him and say, Jesus, I can't hold on to this anymore. Some of our leaders are going to be up here and love to pray for you. And pray with you. I'm going to pray. And if you need to respond in this moment, someone would be glad to pray, pray, pray for you. If you need to respond to Jesus, if you just need prayer. Father, I pray. Lord, that those who need to respond, Lord, that they will respond. Those who need to lay down old habits, Lord. Those who need to Make it right with another brother or sister in the Lord. Maybe they feel they can't do it, Lord, but I know and believe by the power of your Holy Spirit we can do all things in Christ. He strengthens us. God, thank you that you are so good. In Jesus' name.